far as what I can contribute to the ayahuasca discussion, uh, most of the samples that Jonathan discussed this afternoon were actually collected by uh, Cass and myself in 76, and then Dennis wrote that picture uh, using those samples from some that he had obtained earlier that year. They all, almost all came from uh, a single shaman, Don Fidel Mosambique, who was then at the Arena Cocha near Fukuoka. We bioassayed all those grooves, and they were very strong. When I began making my own ayahuasca, I used those experiences as the benchmark for what I was trying to achieve with my own grooves. In terms of recipes, if you want to, you know, rather than trying to substitute an analog, if you're still interested in what goes into a healthy dose of ayahuasca, the way it, what I settled with, I had a clone, a single individual plant called Plowman 6041 that Tim Plowman had collected in Yuri Magwest in 1970 that was called the Cielo Ayahuasca. The Ayahuascaros recognized uh, types of ayahuasca more uh, differentiated than the species. They speak of Cielo Ayahuasca, Trompetero Ayahuasca, so forth and so on. So this was a Cielo Ayahuasca, Plowman 6041, I grew it for many years, and when I made ayahuasca, I used 500 grams of fresh material per dose, and 85 grams of fresh Cicotria viridis per dose, and, and uh, then prepared it in the standard way, which is to boil the total volume of crushed ayahuasca and Cotria viridis, you make it in a non-aluminum pot. You don't use aluminum utensils because the aluminum is reactive and will it mess with the effectiveness of the ayahuasca. And you layer in to the pot, these pots can be quite large, layer in the Cotria leaves, crushed Thanisteriopsis copy, the entire plant vigorously smashed with a hardwood club to separate the fibrous material. And then you um, boil it for four hours at, at a rolling boil, not an explosive boil, but a constant boil. Pour off the deeply yellow liquid that results Carmine is yellow, and you pour off the mother liquor into another container, replace the first wash with a second wash, boil it four hours more, then discard all the solid material, heave it steaming into the bushes, and then <laughs> combine the two washes which is a lot of water, I mean 10, 15 gallons of water, and then depending on, and then drive it down to the number of doses that you have pre-calculated, I can make up to 12 to 15 doses at a time in pots of this size, and I drive it down to 100 milliliters per dose. In the final evaporation, you want to be careful not to boil it too rapidly, or the sugars which are cooked out of the ayahuasca will tend to caramelize and make it thick. <laughs> this is, does not affect the pharmacology of the ayahuasca, it makes it hell to swallow. And if you do it right, you can get it down to 100 milliliters and it will still pour as in, it's as thin as water. It won't thicken unless you have boiled it with too hot a flame. Um, You're not just drawing any uh, uh, psychoactive potentials? The more caramelized one and the more liquid one? No, it's more like it's an aesthetic thing. <coughs> Those who hurried it and 
if you're giving it to people who are knowledgeable, they will comment on this. The sign of amateurish ayahuasca is ayahuasca that's sick, because it needn't be. Those are just sugars. It's not doing any good. My interest in, in ayahuasca, which I indulged over 25 years or so, began with, and if you haven't read it, you should probably read Burroughs and Ginsburg's book, The Yahe Letters, The Search for the Blue Flash, is how I think of it. And it, uh, it sort of initiates the modern era of writing about ayahuasca. Uh, the most recent interesting book about ayahuasca, other than Eduardo's commentaries on the paintings of Pablo Amaringo, is probably Michael Taustig's book, uh, Shamanism, Colonialism, and the Wild Man, which is just a wonderful book. Even if you don't give a hoot about drugs, I think it's a wonderful book for the richness of the language and the way in which he tells the story of the 20th century history of shamanism in the Putumayo region. But my interest in ayahuasca was the same interest that many of the early ethnographers and anthropologists were motivated by, which was persistent rumors of group states of mind. As Jonathan mentioned, the first people to characterize the alkaloid named it telepathine. This was because they had the grandiose hope that this would be a telepathic drug. And in a sense, I think it's too early to dismiss this possibility. Most of us think of telepathy as one person hearing another person think. That I don't think ayahuasca can deliver, but what it can deliver is an incredible ability to see what other people mean. Ayahuasca is driven by sound, by song, by whistling, and uh, it, its ability to transform sound, including vocal sound, into the visual spectrum indicates that some kind of uh, information processing membrane or boundary is being overcome by the pharmacology of this stuff and things normally experienced as acoustically experienced become instead visibly beheld and it's quite spectacular I mean I've had ayahuasca where you know you can sing a tone and just lay down like a Barnett Newman painting a, a chartreuse line an inch and a half wide in the darkness and then you switch the tone and uh, cross it at a 90 degree angle and then as you begin to experiment you discover that the whole modality of behind your closed eyes is open to being driven by by these sounds. And I think probably a lot of the shamanism, especially the off the main rivers shamanism involving ayahuasca, is this kind of pseudo telepathic um, involvement with sound. The interest I mean there are a lot of interesting things about ayahuasca, even in distinction or in contrast with other psychoactive plants. For example, uh, it's essentially brain soup. There's nothing in it which doesn't occur naturally in human neural metabolism. If, if you, when you take ayahuasca, you alter the ratios tremendously and the concentrations. But you know, masculine, um, so far as we know, salvia divinorum, ibogaine. Um, these things don't occur ordinarily in human metabolism. Mescaline might under certain conditions. But the, the major psychedelic neurotransmitters are what are represented in ayahuasca. <coughs> so it's the, and it's the only hallucinogen I know where if it's made right, the next day or the day after the experience, you actually feel better than if you hadn't done it. I mean, even with mushrooms, which is dear to my heart, the day afterwards I tend to keep the phone unplugged and to, you know, 
hot baths and this and that. But on ayahuasca, you're just ready for action. At four o'clock the next morning is necessary. <coughs> and the hallucinations are extraordinary. They seem to occur. In a way, it seems more versatile than psilocybin. The hallucinations can range over a wider range. I mean, they can be anything from nature-based botanical insectile to just you know you name it I remember one one period of hallucination on ayahuasca where it was gold Egyptian hieroglyphics against black and moving through these tunnels and, the, and this sort of thing and it's very uh, I think it's safe it's probably used by more people than any of its psychedelic plant cult in the world if you don't consider cannabis a plant cult. And as a strong house you know, in in Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, down into Bolivia, uh, and then it's made inroads in the twentieth century in a big way into Brazil, portions of Argentina and then more sophisticated populations all over the world are getting, getting wind of this. Are there any questions yeah. about Will it grow in my camera? Oh yeah, it'll grow. It grows well in Hawaii. It could, many, many plants are um, have more restricted ranges than their natural capacity. Plants, most plants have not occupied their full range. This is a consequence of the glaciers only having melted 20,000 years ago. Ayahuasca, uh, I mean, one of the things that interests me that I've talked to Stress Blusher about is um, I think that there may be Banisteriopsis of some sort implicated in Mayan religion. Nobody has ever been able to prove this, but there is a whole elaborate kind of Mayan symbolism that you see at Kalink, uh, I'm sorry, that you see at Tulum and at other sites that's called umbilical symbolism. And I think these things that have been taken for umbilical cords are probably vines of some sort. The last time I was at Tikal, in the ruins themselves, there were many yellow flowers, Malthagaceous flowers on the ground that had clearly been shed by large vines which you could see going up into the canopy. And I collected in Belize uh, a non-flowering Malthagaceous vines that I was unable to distinguish from ayahuasca. So, you know, this, this may well be happening. Um, or could have been happening among the classic minds and the, exactly what their drugs were and who used them is pretty speculative at this point. There's no trace of that in the current mind population? Well, there's I mean, no trace of, of mind use. No, they're pretty, I think, the morning glory seeds, the mushrooms among the Sierra Mazatec and Indians, the Zapotec and the Mixtec, uh, among the Maya, uh, I think the Morning Glory complex and the Salvia Divinorum. And, but whatever else may have gone on, you know, there's a whole, I mean, Jonathan is the expert on this, but there's a whole number of plants which may have been, uh, used for their psychoactive effect in Mexico. Various coleuses, the Emia salicifolia, some people believe certain water lilies, um, old plants like Quarera dia fumibre, even, which is now used as a flavoring for certain kinds of chocolate drinks. Still, there are depictions on pieces of statuary that seem to suggest that maybe this would have a narcotic style of usage in the past. <coughs> Uh, yeah. uh, I have a question about, uh, you're talking about uh, how you, the visual experience was driven by uh, sound. Right. Uh, have you found that the visions could be driven by anything else? Any other uh, uh, occurrences besides sound? Uh, touch or, or 
Well, I tend to lie down and sit still in silent darkness. Um, I suppose cannabis helps most of these things. But really, the ayahuasca is extraordinary. The last time I, I took it to, was in a non-traditional setting, but with one other person, and sitting in completely silent darkness, and this guy had uh, these Tibetan chimes, you know, the kind you strike with a piece of deer horn, mm-hmm. and it would be completely silent, and he would strike this thing, and it would, it would literally it would form a piece of jewelry or a thing like a machine in the air, just just this thing, and this thing would come into being as long as the sound was there, and then it would disappear, and then he would make another one, and it was very clear that we were seeing the same thing because I commented on it and said and described what I was seeing, and it looked like a little thing made out of iridescent titanium with brass connectors and it was like an enormous laurel birch earring or something like that. <laughs> it's a very specific kind of um, object. Um, I think these things are very mysterious. I mean, it, it was a pity that um, that Rocio's English didn't allow a real discussion of uh, these stories about the people who disappear for days and weeks on end who go into a parallel world. Because, you know, if you if you just think that these aboriginal people are ignorant savages, well then you can just dismiss it. But if you have gotten this far on the premise that shamans know what they're talking about, well then you have to take very seriously this more outlandish stuff. You know, I mean, how, where do you draw the line, you know? And ayahuasca is, you know, Eduardo Luna, who some of you know, is uh, very keen to insist that what ayahuasca is really about is where you get on it if you keep these diets for weeks and months and then take it repeatedly over and over in these situations of sensory deprivation. And I think these people are basically erasing uh, ordinary uh, linguistic structures and they live in a world half, perhaps more than half, hallucination. And their fears of magical attack and their relationships to invisible beings and all this is a, a kind of, I suppose, in Western terms, the only thing you could say is it's a kind of self-generated, self-controlled schizophrenia. But that's just a word, schizophrenia. I mean, what it is, is it's a self-generated, self-controlled immersion in a non-causal, parallel um, construct of some sort. And the reason shamans live in isolation and on the periphery of modern and high-density urban civilization is essentially so that they can build these castles in the air that they inhabit. They build unique mythological structures that are like accretions of their very powerful personalities. That's what all this storytelling is about. It's these stories are are the contextual define the contextual limits of what is possible and if you live in a culture where night after night year after year you've grown up around the fire hearing the most respected people in the group tell these outlandish stories then for you it legitimizes the search for a doorway out of mundane experience and that's really the, the only precondition for finding such a doorway. I mean, if you love the weird and you probe it often enough, deeply enough, eventually you'll hit the jackpot, you know, and the door will swing open. And ayahuasca is definitely uh, very effective for, for doing that. Yeah. Uh, I guess the Icaros really generate a lot of visions, the song sung. And some of those are available on cassette. Do you think if that kind of visionary generation would come through on a cassette? If you if you did an ayahuasca analog and well, if you like one listen, of these things? yeah, I mean, if you listen to the music on ayahuasca, 
it is a trans it transforms the music. You have to be very careful. I had an I recall many years ago it was the night of a of a total eclipse or some hellish thing in the sky, a total eclipse of some kind. And Sunwater and Adele, who some of you may know, and I decided that we would do this ayahuasca that I'd had in the back of the refrigerator for years. And this was like a long time ago, maybe eight years ago, and I got it out and I couldn't remember whether Don Fidel had said always shake the bottle or never shake the bottle. So I said, well, to be safe, we should shake the bottle in, in case that's what he did say. So I did, and, and uh, you know, it, I've never had it hit me so hard. And we were, I had put on a record which I had previously found mildly entertaining. And the goal of the first 40 minutes of this ayahuasca trip became to survive the playing of this record. I mean, it was so, uh, I don't know. I've had other experiences. A friend of mine brought me a tape uh, from tribal Afghanistan that I listened to one night in Hawaii on ayahuasca. And I became so alarmed and freaked out. And I just, I could hear something in this music that just shouldn't have been there. I could hear that, you know, this wasn't wizened ragheads in mud huts somewhere, that these guys had connections into the Martian musicians union and the highly agitating. So I think the ayahuasca songs are probably tailored to create a certain aura of confidence and they're reassuring. It's nice to sit with these old guys and 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 watch them make beautiful music. And when you're alone you can sing too. I mean it's very important to sing, especially if you become afraid or alarmed this is the key if you get into deep water with these substances this is true of psilocybin as well you don't want to clench you don't want to assume the fetal position and stop breathing and and you want to sit up straight and breathe and sing and sing it back and it, it will step back it will you know you can take control of your situation most of the time. <laughs> I wanted to ask about the, the parallel universe and American Indian storytelling and mythology. There's a great deal to say about these things. And some of their adventure myths about the two young guys that go out and meet the two chicks and then disappear for 12 years. And, you know, this is a common and enduring theme, but it's my thinking of precision that this kind of study group, and I'd like you to expound a little bit about when you get into that place, what level of verity do you find yourself giving it? Well, I, I'm very, very careful. I mean, like the way I do these things normally is alone, mm -hmm. and I unplug the telephone, and I don't tell anybody I'm going to do it, and I do it in darkness and I roll joints in front of me so I don't even have to move. And basically, once it gets going, I don't do anything because I'm so aware of how involved in it is. I mean, I don't... I think you have to be almost a damn fool to just grab hold of this stuff and start flailing it around. I mean, for me, it's like I creep up to the abyss and hang my head over it and look, and then I edge back to them. The idea of trying to actually do something is terrifying because it'll work. I mean, you can do it, but, but you don't understand what you're doing. So I'm, I like to look. Uh, the guy, mm -hmm. you know, Peter Sellers. But the shamans are going in there, they're doing purposeful work for the community. They cure. They cure and they get information. And, uh, but the main thing, I mean, I think the getting information thing is sort of overstressed because it's astonishing and it proves that it's a higher dimension. I mean, if somebody really can see who stole the chicken, and they really can see, then even though it's a trivial matter about a chicken, 
not, there's nothing trivial about the fact that they are exhibiting a paranormal ability which seems to involve the contradiction of cause and effect. How can they see who stole the chicken? Number one, the chicken has already been stolen by the time the question is asked of the shaman. Well, so then does the shaman travel back in time? Does the shaman read the minds of everyone in the tribe and, and look and find who stole the chicken that way? Or is it just an inspired guess backed up by social pressure? Uh, what exactly is going on here? And then when you turn toward the future, it becomes even more mysterious because many of these shamanic things are about uh, deciding where the hunting will take place and saying, you know, if we go to the second waterfall, then there will be Katibari to be killed. And then they go and there is and they do. Well, if you believe that this person actually saw the future, then you're coming perilously close to some kind of determinism, which is, you know, not supportable philosophically. I mean, if the universe is absolutely determined, then thinking has no meaning. Because if the universe is determined, then you think what you think because you couldn't think anything else. Yeah. So thinking suddenly is divorced from the enterprise of knowing reality. And that's a little discouraging to those of us who butter our bread in the fields of philosophy. So I think it's, you know, it's very mysterious. The model that I use for all of these psychedelics is a mathematical model, not a psychological model or a spiritual model, but a mathematical model. Mind, under the pressure of evolution, under the pressure of the need to defend self and offspring, has folded itself down into the three-dimensional space-time matrix of the body. Mind has sort of has crippled itself in order to caretake the body and the here and now. Well, when you take these psychedelics, it's like it's severed. The mind is severed from the physical envelope. And you wander in a much larger dimension. And it is, a dimen it is literally a higher dimensional manifold. And that's how these apparently miraculous and magical things, that's why the shaman can see into a human body, because in a higher dimension, the inside and the outside are the same place. There is no distinction. So it's an inner sensorium that has a higher dimensional uh, character to it. It's a great mystery, you know, I mean, it doesn't need to detain us here, but it's a great mystery, the relationship of consciousness to number and of nature to number. After all, nature is nature, the deployed three-dimensional physical world in its dynamic. Numbers are abstractions generated, so far as we know, only by the human mind. They are inventions of the human mind. And yet nothing is as descriptive of nature. No tool is as powerful a descriptor of nature as mathematics. But why is this? Well, ayahuasca seems to say it's because uh, the mathematical, the higher mathematical dimensions of the world are objects not merely for abstract deductive uh, discovery, but for experiential encounters. And then if this is true, then our world as we experience it in the here and now and day to day is hopelessly limited and circumscribed. And this is you know, a very limited world that we're operating in inside our culture, inside our language, inside our body and so forth and so on. And in the silence, in the darkness, swept away by these alien alkaloids and the plant mind behind them, you, know, you find out a truth that can barely be told. And most of it can't be told. Yeah. Uh, what about your uh, sense of self and, and uh, 
in the Iowa system? Yeah, or? Yeah, ego in general. Well, I think that the you know the, the these things are very humbling. It's very hard to do if you have an ego. That's very if you're for instance, I mean, if you're the kind of person that other people consider a jackass it's pretty hard to do these things if other people's judgment on you is correct. You know, I mean, the person like who can dominate uh, a noisy bar is not probably a good candidate for ayahuasca. <laughs> that kind of bravado and machismo. And, you know, I mean, ayahuasca loves to take prideful people and rub their nose in it. I mean, it can make you beg for mercy like nothing. You know, you have to really approach it humbly. I mean, I speak from experience because I, you know, I probably am easily betrayed into assuming I know what I'm doing, and that's the moment when catastrophe strikes. And what I always say to it when I go into it, I say, you know, I'm going to take a big dose, so. Please don't kill me. <laughs> Here I am. I'm yours. I surrender. I hold nothing back. I didn't cut the dose. I didn't water. I didn't water the tea. So please don't kill me. And then it usually responds by not killing me. If it so amuses you, but you know you, you can't demand it. The, the real bad trips come when you try to put the squeeze on it. You know when you try to force a piece of information. And uh, can we move here? Because that's the difference also in the, in the cultural context of ayahuasca and many areas where the where there's been a lot of social disruption the community, the roads, or hundreds of years of missionary influence. Um, and what is still remaining in the ayahuasca culture is that the people always treat you with some kind of intense need to heal someone or to like send a star <laughs> to your spell to kill someone or something. They don't just take it just to completely just surrender themselves and just to lake. I mean, they did too, like during the like during the initiation stuff. But I mean, once they like the shamans, I guess, or even a lot of the young people really, they'll just take it with some, something in mind. And, you know, of course, there's exceptions. So the difference with that is that a lot of times, um, like you hear a lot of weird stories about like um, I don't know, like young upstart shamans that they like have this, like a lightning bolt tap them or a tree fall on them or something like that. Because like, there's a lot of weird black magic that goes on too because a lot of people just don't have what we to and so a, lo- a lot of deaths are attributed to, to ayahuasca or to black magic or and I think a lot of shamans if are <coughs> they like to just graze the underbelly of the thing they're really concerned about their community and healing sick people and holding it all together. It's an exceptional personality in any society, Amazonian or urban American, who is a go for the gusto kind of person who just wants to get as loaded as they possibly can. I mean, this shaman that I studied with in Peru, the ayahuasca that we would take on Saturday nights of touring would be only about two-thirds as strong. And then every Wednesday night, we would take it just he and a couple of other people. And he said, this was, this was our school, he said. This is when we learn. On Saturday nights, we cure the people. But on Wednesday nights, you know, we plunge to the death. And uh, it was a much more uh, intense, quiet, inward kind of driving in those situations. So if we took our walk on a Wednesday, we'd be having a simultaneous experience with these folks down there. Quite so. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Every Wednesday. Every any day of the week. The week somebody's loaded. Cheers. <laughs> How, how would you compare the the nature of reality or perceived reality under ayahuasca and under mushrooms? Well, 
the, the, the thing about psilocybin that is so extraordinary, and I think enough people have experienced this now that we can make a generalization about it, the, the mushrooms talk, they speak to you in your native tongue and at conversational speed and it's, you know, the damnedest thing until it happens to you. You can't imagine what somebody could be talking about. Once it happens to you, you know exactly what they mean. The mushroom is animate and articulate and also kind of extraterrestrial. It, it, its hallucinations tend to the grandiose, the history ending, the galactarian destiny that awaits the biological overmind is this ta -da, ta -da, kind of thing. <laughs> Ayahuasca is biological and organic and you feel the spirit of the forest like Rosia said. It's, uh, it's more feminine and after a good Ayahuasca trip you feel like your eyes are just bugging out of your head because you've spent so much time looking. The language of ayahuasca is visual. It shows you and shows you and shows you and shows you and once this showing gets going, you know, it's hard to shut it off. I mean, it really wants to show, but it's, it's silently, it spills out this cornucopia of images and you sing and you manipulate them, where the, the mushroom is, you know, highly articulate. It also is visual, but it also can talk, which is just such an astonishing thing for a Western, and we are just not prepared for talking fungi. Have you tried the two together? The two together? I wouldn't do that, actually, because I think the monoamine oxidase inhibiting properties of the harmine would so intensify and synergize the psilocybin that uh, you might find yourself swinging from the chandelier. <laughs> and the, shaman don't do, the shamans don't do that either in the Amazon, and you can rarely get an ayahuasca to give you the time of day regarding mushrooms. They always say, well, we use mushrooms when we don't have ayahuasca, but the caveat is, and we always have ayahuasca. Is it common for women to, have you been in the jungle, women taking ayahuasca, or is it, I mean, because of driving? It depends on the tribal, it depends on the people, but around Pucalpa, there were women in the circles. There was this woman, this ancient woman in Lisa Ura Angulo who just, you know, she drank with the best of them and would recount outrageous visions. And this lady must have weighed under a hundred pounds. One of the shamanesses or shaman, female shamans that we tried to contact in 76 is this famous woman who studied with Manuel Cardova Rios the guy who wrote Wizard of the Upper Amazon. Her name was Juana Gonzalez Opi. He told us about her. She had come to him as a girl of uh, 25 with leprosy, and he had taken her into the woods for six months and cured her of leprosy, which that you can cure leprosy by ayahuasca is definitely an unorthodox idea. And she became a, a major ayahuasca in this area, and her stuff was said to be the best. And then, and, but she had lost her, her hands and her feet, so the experience of taking ayahuasca with her was fraught with her presence, which was freakish in the extreme, especially in the flickering firelight. <laughs> There's a um, sort of a new field of medicine, healing and sound, in which a person's voice is analyzed, the spectrum analyzer, and the missing notes are provided to that person, just either by singing or humming, or to, to get the person to just match the notes that he's missing, apparently will heal all kinds of ailments. And I'm wondering if you can see sound, if the pure neuro just can see by the sound that person's voice is making what's totally missing in his picture, 
as in thing of the Well, there's the obvious that there's some kind of diagnostic sensitivity to invisible stuff that we don't ordinarily perceive. We were talking last week, some of you may have seen this. I mention it because I'm trying to confirm it. I've seen on three occasions in my life, at about this light level, sitting watching someone in profile as you're watching me, uh, on a very slight dose of mushrooms, there's something which goes on in front of a person's mouth. It, it looks like it, it looks like oil in water. And my rational explanation for what this is is that you pull air into your lungs and it is heated and therefore it has a slightly different refractive index than the cold air in front of your face. And so when you speak, the mixing of the hot and cold air can be perceived under some conditions, and I would get photographed under some conditions, as, an, as a kind of oily, turbulent something in front of your mouth. Well, is that cheerful explanation correct, or are we on the brink of something else, some, some more uh, demanding or exotic phenomenon? I don't know. Yeah. Going back just a little bit, I should probably mention a friend and I have been growing uh, ayahuasca clones, uh, I guess it's from your clone actually, for three years. And uh, in the lack of uh, the psychiatry or DMT additives, uh, my friend has uh, reported numerous successes with shrooms. Adding the shrooms to the ayahuasca? Yes. What proportion do you know? Not sure. It would be interesting to know. I think you might get away with that. Probably what it would be is a fair bit of ayahuasca and a tiny bit of mushrooms. One of the longest, hardest evenings I ever spent was I got the idea I would take half a dose of ayahuasca and half a dose of mushrooms. And I, I felt like I was battling demons to return with a shred of my sanity. I mean, it was just ghastly. I was pretty phobic of that combo. You took them at different times? No, I took them together. Hmm. Two and a half grams of mushrooms and a half a dose of ayahuasca. And it turned me every way but loose. And it was unpleasant. I mean, I really thought I had done it this time. It, what it did was it interfered. It was very clear. What, well, it was very clear. What seemed to be happening was that it was interrupting RNA transcription of short-term memory. So I could, I knew who I was and my history and how I had gotten into this situation, but I couldn't remember the last three minutes at all. And this would create this anxiety in me. And then I would forget why I was anxious. And then that would create more anxiety. And I was into some kind of intellectual redress that was... Uh, I, I was just riveted in this chair, and I thought, you know, if this doesn't unsnap itself, they'll just put me in a ward somewhere, you know, I'll just be carried out of here. Uh, and it, it felt like, you know, that scene in 2001 when he, the guy is outside making the repair and then he comes back and says, open the pod door, Hal. <laughs> <laughs> I can't do that, Jay. Well, it was I was making all of the jam in the magic machinery in the synapse. I mean, I had this very clear vision of, oh, God, it's gone down the wrong pathway. The degradative enzyme has somehow been locked out of the process. And here we are, folks. The circling the airfield, running out of fuel, zero visibility down below, and after about two or three hours of this, it, uh, it invades us.